All my life I've seen you slowly going gold, slowly letting go your shade another year, felt your needles ticking down your limbs to soothe the summer duff to sleep again, your soft voice falling in October light. Your gold tongue is spot fire on the ridge, saying silently that change must come where all those changeless conifers believe that any turn from official hue can mean the end. And still you flare and freeze on steep north slopes. In Idaho, you asked what color I would be. I stared at you, said subtle green, said gold, brown, black wet. And living in Montana, you gave me fence and roof and beams. And here your, st your form still gives me shape in cavities of snag. You stand now as ghost women on the mountain whose blood is sinking in my veins at night, whose double names I take to like confounding hope whose heartwood is the tough, straight muscle that gives me light, whose fire is fire that speaks as it burns up. I choose you, Larch, to all those splattering loud leaves in hard and famous forests in some country far from this interior, this west. Hold to that ridge for me another year, Hold to that brilliance mottling the falling light so still and clear, my changer who remains. I'm George Venn. I'm a writer. George Venn is more than just a writer. He's a renowned poet, literary historian, Stuart Holbrook Award and Pushcart Prize winner, teacher, professor, editor, environmentalist, biographer, storyteller, Oregon Book Award winner, gardener, musician, folklorist, woodworker, and yes, George Venn is an accomplished and eclectic writer. In 1970, George moved to La Grande, Oregon, where he taught at Eastern Oregon University for 29 years. From an early age, the Northwest region has profoundly nurtured George's life and writing. To make a long story short, I grew up in western Washington, the towns of Tacoma, Burlington, and Bellingham, Tacoma, where I was born. And then in the seventh grade, my family moved to northern Idaho to a place called Spirit Lake. Graduated from high school there, went to the College of Idaho in southern Idaho, Caldwell. That accounts for the first few years until uh, I graduated from college. My grandparents came to my rescue as an infant and agreed to raise me and my brother after my father died. We were raised by my grandparents in a place called Alder, which is just south of Mount Rainier. We'd spend our summers there with them, and then we would go back to the city to go to school and live in the Presbyterian manse that was my stepfather's occupation. They were basically agricultural Wisconsin farming people. Their influence on me was profound insofar as I grew up in a world where you did things for yourself, where you didn't quit, where you always did your best to cover your expenses yourself. My grandfather was a beekeeper. That had a great influence on me because of the fact that he took me along in many cases to work with his apiary in the valley. Basically got my attention as a very young kid to the complexities and beauties of the hive. When I came to the concept of ecology in my freshman biology class, I realized that I had been introduced to a profoundly complex ecological insight by being responsible for, for the hives of 600 hives of my grandfather's honeybees, working with him side by side, day in and day out for the entire season. That sense of a holistic you know, approach to things as Barry Commoner says, everything is connected to everything else, made my view of the world quite different, I think, than many other people, because I began to see things, not just what I saw in town during the nine months of school, 
but I saw this other world opening up, introduced me to life east of the Cascades. Well, I went back and forth between those two worlds and was very much aware of how it is that people treat each other under those conditions because I had immediate built-in contrast between laissez-faire kind of parenting and a very you know, demanding kind of parenting. So I tended to lean philosophically, spiritually, emotionally to my grandparents' general sense, live and let live. Pour out your life as water on dry ground. Then when you think you're empty, pour out your life again. Watch yourself slowly soak away and disappear without, you think, the slightest trace that you poured your life out here like water. Face it, you may now sing or you could moan. Whatever springs from this life you gave for love, you may never see come green. The seeds of earth lie infinite and deep and lives unknown might someday grow from your wordless bones, your lost years. So today, once more, take the longer view. Pour out your life as water on dry ground. And when you're empty, pour out your life again. George approaches the craft of writing like a honeybee flying or a beekeeper opening a hive. He just never knows what he might discover. Beginning basically in, in, as an undergraduate, abandoned you know, by uh, the idea that you're going to get it right the first time. So you'll learn to engage in the writing process. And as a result, of course, you will learn to grow. You then make discoveries as you are working on the next piece. Because each poem, in a sense, is, is expecting different, different moves from you different discoveries, serendipities show up, things that you hadn't thought of. That's the, uh, the, the beauty of the writing process, is you're always surprised that something shows up on the page that you hadn't thought of. You start out maybe with a line, or even with a word, or with an impression, but you don't know where it's going for sure. You just follow it to see where it's going to take you. I think the important problem for every writer is you know, to know when to stop when, you know, when you've gone as far as you can for the given piece or a given day. George is a true student of the world. This broad understanding of the world began with travel for his grandfather's beekeeping business. The awareness expanded with high school teachers from Greece, the Philippines, Italy, and Cuba, and further expanded by college dormitory friends from Kenya, Japan, Argentina, and Hawaii. He also got to know Black and Latino students on campus. The beautiful soprano, Barbara Hampton. The speedy halfback, Larry Brown. And the middleweight boxer, Roscoe Maddox. Living with and befriending international students in his dorm throughout his college years helped shape George's early commitment to cultural diversity and inclusivity. So I had really, in, in, shall I say, intensive... Uh, awareness of, the, of other cultures and the, the differences that they would bring to us. My experience is enriched by, and, uh, and my perspective is dramatically altered. I begin to see, but not only friendships, but also see the world. It was just an expanding universe, and that's what launched me after two years. I finished my undergraduate requirements and still didn't have a major, so I ended up going to Latin America for a year to live and work, which changed everything. So the overall process of becoming more international as I wrote to my parents, we were basically launched and I had almost decided to stay there and become a diplomat to take up the issue of internationalism and becoming a citizen of the world. Language as a device for the achievement of peace conducted in such a way that resolution is possible. Right, namely, you find ways to connect with each other. During his last term at the University of Montana, George took a course titled Ecology, Economics, and Environment. 
That study gave him his first formal understanding of the relationship between broad ecological issues and his beekeeping experience. He read Leopold's Sand County Almanac, the book which opened his eyes to the land ethic and to the organic values and practices of the environmental conservation movement. From the time George moved from Montana to Oregon's Grand Run Valley in 1970, he was on his way to becoming an advocate for environmental causes, and he became aware of the proposal by the Army Corps of Engineers to dam Catherine Creek. He led and won that battle. The creek still runs, and it's one of the few streams they know can be rehabilitated for endangered salmon runs. This was an experience that directly expresses the relationship between being a conservationist and being a writer and poet. I don't know if I can say this without oversimplification. The encounter with the universe leads to revelation. The revelations are vast and amazing insofar as you learn to see, if you're lucky, your poems will take you to places of insight. You will be awakened to the, the nature of the world and the universe and its working and of your own place or lack of a place in that. I think that uh, everything I've written in some ways is derived from that perspective. If you focus carefully and thoughtfully, it will yield a revelation that is not otherwise available. You know, you can't plan your great discoveries. You have them given to you. It's like the geese flying over your head in this new poem I've just written. And it's beginning to symbolize that there is unity and resolution available to us as a people. That kind of realization, I guess, I would hope would be available you know, to, uh, to anybody who reads my work. What's George hoping to illuminate here? You never quite know, or you do. Throughout his career, George has taken the task of preserving the written history of others, making sure their stories are not forgotten. From translating the Chinese modernist poet Ai Ching, to editing anthologies like the Eastern Organ Literary Supplement and Organ Literature Series, to developing collections like Darkroom Soldier and Beaver's Fire, to compiling autobiographies like the new monumental tome of Brock Evans. George feels a sense of responsibility to bring these stories to light. Just like his environmental conservation, his written history conservation is profound. Though the sense of responsibility for other writers is very high in my, in, in my consciousness. I refer to this as the bardic obligation. In the ancient tradition, the bard was the person who could repeat the entire history of the tribe or the kingdom on command and take responsibility for all of those stories. The idea that you're responsible for other writers has been very high on my list of desired outcomes. Someone needs to take responsibility for literary culture. That's the bardic obligation. It's not just about you. It's about the whole literary community functioning to preserve what is best in it, not to just throw everything away. The endless stories of people finding their grandparents' letters in the garbage are too well known. My view is, is you're responsible for the stories that your neighbors aren't telling. Neighborhood stories make up the, the heritage, the emotional life that everyone can share. That's, I guess, the kind of evidence that you would hope for a writer to learn that someone's life has been enriched in a way that they had never expected because of a story keeping alive that sense of what it means to be human, feel what it is that other people feel who are living right down the road from you or right next door. As Bill Stafford used to say, you know, life improves by being shared. And our overall picture, I think, is, is that's one of the things writers can do. That's what we're doing right now. You're eliciting from me all this shared life, shared story, passing it on to you, and maybe somebody else will get it as well depending on where they are and what they're listening for. I can remember writing a line in one of my poems which says, prepare yourself to be forgotten here. 
becomes one of those warnings that you issue for yourself because of the fact that you know so much is transitory. So much is, is not saved for whatever reason. Most people don't know what I've done because it's been spread out over 50 years. It's kind of like the, you know, there are 33 creeks that flow into the Grand Ronde Valley. Nobody that I know of, except maybe the guy you're talking to, has even bothered to try to find out what the names of all those 33 creeks are. And that's, I think, the nature of the image. You contribute something, and you don't know what is going to happen, right? You can, and you contribute something else, and you don't know what's going to happen to that. You gamble that maybe somebody, somebody will, will learn the names of those creeks. You know, maybe somebody will learn the names of those writers. Over your white head, flights of October geese cry and call, discuss their move from lake to marsh and open water now. This time of year when you hear their calls, look up and try to count their passing V after V, always even numbers in those wings cruising over you. Such steady power, such beauty, calls for someone to rejoice in this downy, wild flyway and the honk that lifts your eyes. You marvel as all their black necks, white cheeks, brown wings demonstrate how to fly peaceably in a universe of pain. You know, a lot Jonathan Nicholas called me the literary lion of Legrand, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. I could growl for him, right? Yeah, yeah.